Welcome to the Winner's Journey podcast, where you hear from inspiring figures to unleash the winner in you. I'm your host, Viviana Puello, and today I am honored and excited to present our guest because he's a master artist that has inspired my journey through the years. He has been featured in the pages of our magazine, Art Tour International, and also on the covers and numerous publications. His work is most admired by our audience. He's an award-winning master artist regarded as one of the world's leading sculptures of our times. He has exhibited internationally, and you have probably seen one of his monumental public sculptures around, which transmits his passion for eternal values and emotions. His work explored themes of love, relationships, and emotional trauma, depicting humanity in interaction with itself. Master artist Lorenzo Quinn was born in Rome to the Oscar award-winning Mexican-American actor Anthony Quinn and his wife, costume designer Yolanda Adolori. Quinn's childhood was split between Italy and the United States. His father had a profound influence on him, both in terms of living in the limelight of the film world and with respect to Anthony's early work in painting and sculpting architecture. Welcome to the Winner's Journey podcast, Lorenzo. Well, thank you so much for yes. welcoming us to your studio. Let me do a quick tour of uh, my studio. And this is the main office space. Here we're going to, to, this is the meeting room. Wait, let me take you to the meeting room. This is the meeting room, jewelry room for the jewel. Of course, they're inspired on my, by my sculptures. They're inspired by my sculptures. These are the jewels. This is the room and we're back in the office area. I'm gonna now uh, take you downstairs where uh, the creator, we have some uh, maquettes for work in progress. This is a fingerprint I did with my own blood. This is my wall and uh, my uh, desk. I will now take you downstairs quickly. I moved into the studio um, two years ago. So that's the four loves. This is a sculpture called Moments. So this is the main entrance. The main entrance uh, leads you upstairs to the offices or here in the actual creative uh, area. Beautiful. This is the room leading into my smaller studio, which is this one. Here we are. This is the small area where I work with uh, live models. As you can see, I'm starting here, male figure. So yeah, working on a piece here. And now I'm gonna take you to the big area. This is the exhibition area. Wow. Yeah, actually I call it the wow room because everybody that are in this, they always say wow. So from there, I decided to call it the wow room. So these are the small building bridges small uh, replicas of building bridges at a scale of uh, one to three. So the ones in Venice are three times as big. This is a sculpture give. Recently people, I've asked people to jump into the hands uh, as a playful gesture. Um, you know, art has to be lived. And um, we have uh, quite a few of my pieces here. 
We have, that's the finding love. Here we have the force of nature. This is meeting hearts. This is a replica of the uh, Venice uh, hands, the support hands. And uh, well, we have more work down there. This is the gravity. And now let me show you the large area where I make the large sculptures, which is here. So you see this? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is my... As you can tell, I'm speechless. <laughs> so this is my studio. This is my studio. This is, I'm working on this piece here. It's pretty big. It's a force of nature. You can see the size of this uh, here next to that. I put myself next to it so you kind of figure out the size of that piece there. This is a, um, a portrait I'm working on. Um, so basically this is my, this is my world. Okay, this is my world. Of course, I have a, a garden outside where I have also more work. These some preparatory drawings that I was doing. Yes, so since we're in your studio, I'm just intrigued as many people probably watching. What, can you walk us through your creative process? So where does it start? I mean, these are monumental pieces that you're creating where where is the beginning of this yeah well listen it, de it depends really because um it depends what i'm creating and when i'm uh, creating it there it's not always the same uh what 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 is always the same is that whatever i make whatever work of art i make it has to have a meaning in the sense that I don't conceive of a work of art simply for its um, aesthetic uh, aspect. Uh, for me, the most important factor is the emotional aspect behind the work, the message behind the work. Um, you know, many times I get commissions, you know, people want me to make a commission. And they say, could you do this? And a company comes and says, I want you to do this. I want you to do that. Uh, of course, many times I have declined to do it because, you know, it's not all about the money. Uh, in fact, most of the time it's not about the money. Um, it's, I have to feel the inspiration. And if I'm not inspired, I can't do it. It's, it really doesn't matter. So... I actually prefer to sculpt um, from uh, my heart, meaning to sculpt uh, things that I have created rather than somebody coming and asking me for uh, a commission for a specific company. Um, so when that happens, for example, what I will ask people is, okay, well, what does your company express? I mean, what do you want to transmit? Is it love? Is it uh, compassion? Is it, uh, what emotional value are you spreading? And then I tend, uh, and then I will focus on that, representing that emotional value. And that for me is the easiest way to work. So I work from an emotional content um, and then I think of materializing that into work of art uh, and giving it form um, I never work the other way around in sense I never say I want to make a sculpture that looks like this and then let me think of now the meaning you know so first it's the meaning then it's the aesthetics so you get the message and then you express it yeah, of course, it's, you know, some, a lot of my work is very descriptive. Um, it's plain. It's, you, you get what you see. Uh, there's no hidden message. 
um, a, especially in contemporary art, uh, a lot of art is based on, um, at times, on a hidden message um, where the artist doesn't make a clear effort uh, for the artwork to be understood. And it is the critic and it is left up to the people to find out the interpretation of that artwork. Um, on one side, I'm okay with that. I, you know, even with my own artwork, I love people to come up with different interpretations. You know, I come up with one interpretation of my artwork and I'm happy with people to start a conversation with people and say, look, I see what you were trying to say with this work and I read the poem and, it, and you know, and I understand what you're, what you're saying, but for me, it represents something else. See, once that happens, we're starting a dialogue. And I think art is about that. It's about dialogue, about have a dialogue, you know, it's not a monologue. And I think that art has to be a universal language for everybody to understand. And uh, the same way I'm talking to you now, in a way and in a language that you understand, because we're trying to have a conversation, uh, that's how I view art uh, the same way. Well, you're inspiring. And, and I think it's, if any artist is watching, this is, this is a big deal. Because I think a lot of artists, um, especially when you're starting, are looking at, of course, how to uh, monetize what you're doing, right? And worried about that. So priority is given to the message in, in your case. I think that's the best way to go also. Well, I'll tell you how I start. How, I'll tell you how I started. Well, first of all, you have to understand that when I'm in, in some sense, of course, I've been very lucky. I've been working and supporting myself now as an artist for 35 years. So it just, it didn't happen overnight. Um, art is a slow uh, career. Um, it can be steady if you do your job steadily and you work at your uh, craft and you, you know, there were times that were incredibly hard. Uh, of course, days and nights and months that I cried, um, worried how I would support myself, support my family. Um, it's tough. Um, and by the way, as a, as a sculptor, it's probably even harder because you have a cost of material. Yeah, as, um, as a sculptor, and this goes out to all the sculptors, um, you have to expect it being also more difficult in the beginning because you have the added cost of the actual material. Um, in fact, I remember myself starting off uh, by drawing and then painting. And I remember that when I was painting, I could do it in a, in a separate room. I could do it in an area, uh, a much smaller area. I could dedicate even a, a, a section of the room to do my paintings and to keep my stuff stored. But of course, as a sculptor, I realized I needed a separate space. Um, I had the, the cost of the material itself. In the beginning, for example, I wasn't casting my art in, in bronze. Uh, I couldn't afford it. I was casting it in um, something called bonded bronze. It's like a, it's a resin. Uh, with a bronze coating, a powder, bronze coating powder. Uh, so it looks like bronze, but it's not bronze. Um, it was much cheaper to cast that way. And then if I was lucky enough to sell the piece, I would then cast it for the client in bronze. Um, but, you know, as I said, nowadays, especially the young people, I see it, I have three, I have three children, you know. So I know how I was when I was young. I see the kids now, how they, everybody is looking for immediate success, you know? It was interesting, they did a, they did a um, uh, I, was, I was looking at this documentary, very interesting documentary, and they were interviewing children of today, and, um, and they showed an interview uh, with children 50 years ago. And uh, the answers that the kids were giving were completely different uh, today from 50 years ago. Uh, you know, they would ask people what they, children, what they wanted to be. You know, back then, the most, of course, uh, crazy answer 
uh, was an astronaut. They wanted to be astronauts. Uh, most of them wanted to be uh, doctors, uh, firemen, policemen. Um, now, most of the people, most of the kids asked, uh, they want to be famous. Um, interesting, as if fame itself was a career, uh, as if fame itself was a profession. Uh, so they don't care how, but they just want to be famous. Well, art obviously is not something that's going to um, fulfill that. Um, art is not about fame. Art is about doing your job um, passionately, working hard at it. Uh, it's not a one painting uh, gig. It's not a one sculpture gig where that sculpture launches you uh, to stardom or that painting launches you to stardom. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about building blocks, building blocks, baby steps, um, one grain of sand at a time. Um, and I stress to all young artists that the, the basics of art, um, you know, talent is very important, but talent has to be accompanied by technique, which absolutely can be learned. Um, a lot of people think that talent alone will, will do it and they forego the technique and they forego the schooling. I think schooling is very important. I think uh, knowing how to draw is very important because if you don't have the technique, you will be limiting your uh, talent because if you want to, you're, you're, because you have a creative mind and you're very talented and you want to do this or that, but you won't be able to do this or that if uh, you have not studied and if you don't have the technique to do that. So that for me is very, very, very important. And I see more and more young artists foregoing that and going directly into abstract art. Let's not forget that the most important abstract artists of the past uh, started as fantastic um, craftsmen. They knew their craft very well. They knew how to draw very well. They then decided to draw something completely different and abstract, but it came from great knowledge. Um, and a lot of young artists now are trying to go directly to that without having to go through the knowledge. And that is something that saddens me. So, yeah, that would definitely be something I, I'd stress. And uh, the not rushing. Don't rush. Don't rush. Um, and don't give up. You know, there's uh, years <laughs> and years uh, of uh, darker periods, you know. The great thing is that when you're young, you have this strength, you have this passion, you have a willpower that will keep you going. Um, and... Uh, the also another thing today that we didn't have back then is this it's a double-edged sword but it can be if used well it's fantastic you have all this the access of all this knowledge out there you know you have internet so you can do all the courses you want to do from your own home you can look at everything you want to look you could study at other artists uh see what other artists are doing then of course the biggest thing that any artist can hope to achieve is to be unique. To be unique is very difficult. I think it's probably the most uh, difficult thing to achieve is to find a niche for yourself um, that will define you, that people will then say, oh, that is so-and-so. Oh, that is, I, I recognize it because I see, you know, I see it. But, you know, it, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to develop that overnight. Again, it takes, uh, it, it takes time. It takes sometimes years to develop your own unique uniqueness. Um, so that's my, that's my two cents. <laughs> and your work is unique. I tell you that I had a surreal experience with your work. I was at the Venice Canal and I see these hands 
like you say, from far away, I was in a boat and I said, oh, Lorenzo Queen, <laughs> right away, right? And, and your work is, I think it's when you have a monumental uh, sculpture, it's more of an experience than anything else. It's this incredible energy that, that you receive when you're experiencing this art. And that ties up with what you're saying about getting ready, preparing, starting, educating yourself. And that links to my next question, which is what takes, what is the process when it comes to one of these huge monumental installations? Because I know it's, you have to know what you're doing, right? Yeah, I have a fantastic team I work with. So of course I come up with uh, the initial design and then I uh, propose that design to my team and I work with uh, an engineering team and architects uh, when, when need be. And uh, we discuss the feasibility of it, maybe have to make some changes to it. Uh, basically, we need to know where it's going to go, um, the grounds, uh, the infrastructure, um, how do we get it there. Um, so because if it's monumental and it's huge, of course, it has to be sent over in bits and parts and then we assemble there. And that will affect uh the actual creativity process um because you need to know um, how to uh, assemble the piece and therefore how am i going to create this in a way that if i have to assemble it there and it's bronze or it's aluminium and it's and it, let's say um you can't see the seams uh and you and i can't weld on site uh i have to create in a different way. If that is not an issue, then I can create it a different way. Of course, that'll affect many other things. It'll, it'll affect the uh, uh, cost of the piece, choice of material. Um, also, the place will define, in fact, the material. If I can't make it in a certain material in Miami as the same as I would do, for example, um, in a country that doesn't have uh, hurricanes. Um, so it's very important when I'm making work to know when it, monumental work, where that work is going to be placed. Also the loads, the weights and all that. Um, so yeah, so first of all, again, it starts with a message. It starts with a drawing, uh, with uh, a, a very simple pencil drawing. Uh, and, then, and then the more technical aspects of it. I would say actually first it's the dream <laughs> and then it's like okay the dream uh, moment is over now let's let's you know let's wake up and see if we can make this actually happen uh, so how can I have these hands you know dreaming of having hands coming out of the canal holding uh, a building a uh, 15th century building is one thing doing it was completely another mm. Mm. And speaking of dreams, uh, one of my favorite, I have many favorite pieces of yours, but Gaia is, is on the top of that list for me. It, it speaks to me a lot about, you know, the, the environment, the planet, um, and how much we need to take care of it. And I know you well, have- Well, I, I, sorry to interrupt you. I launched a, uh, a Gaia challenge today. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, um because I usually roam the coast here uh, on my bicycle and walking and hiking because I love nature. Uh, and I see these areas that, uh, you know, people are just throwing trash and I, I just don't understand it. And they're the, probably the first ones that when they travel appreciate the beauty of Switzerland and of these beautiful places, but then come home and throw the trash on, the, uh, on their own backyard, basically. Um, it's as if you were come to your own home in your kitchen and empty a trash can in your kitchen. You wouldn't do that. But they do that outside. This is our world. We have to take care of it. The world outside is like the world inside. It's like our kitchen. It's like our living room. Um, it's everybody's kitchen. It's everybody's living room. And we have to take care of it. We have to. So I did a cleanup uh, of the area. And uh, I launched a challenge because, you know, it's fun and games watching dance challenges, you know. 
but why don't we do an actual real challenge that will make the world a better place? Okay, so what's the challenge? Can you share with us? And clean, up, clean up, clean up. Clean up and share the video of okay. you cleaning up an area, a common area. All righty, I'll be activating it here too. I'll be sharing it. That sounds exciting. Please. It is so productive. So speaking of Gaia, I know you have a project coming out with Gaia, uh, a dream for Gaia. Can you share that with us? Yes, I'm working on it. At present, I want to make it into reality. I want to create a, a, a monument to Gaia, to Mother Nature, um, and uh, to the soul of the earth, Gaia. And my dream would be to materialize this this year. I'm working towards it. Um, so hopefully it will happen. It's a very large, uh, it's a monumental piece where you, you will have gained access inside. It'll be made out of, uh, which is uh, different for, uh, for me because I've never worked in this material. It's a biodegradable material. It's like bamboo. Um, and um, because we will have to take care of it uh, or else it will degrade, same as the earth. If we don't take care of it, uh, the world, the nature will degrade as well. I want to create a garden of Eden inside. Again, something that we will have to take care of or else it will also degrade. And show people uh, really uh, with very, very visually uh, how fragile the world is and how we have to love it and take care of it and, and nourish it. Uh, so it will basically act as a daily reminder other fragility of nature and this uh, balance, uh, very precarious balance that uh, right now we're holding. And um, if we don't do it right, uh, you know, it's basically gonna go down the drain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we have a deadline for that. We pretty much have to move. Yeah, um, look, um, I, I know the science, I'm not a scientist. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm not a. Uh, I'm not an expert. That's for sure. But I have studied the science behind it. Uh, I don't expect to have all the answers. I actually, obviously, don't have all the answers. Um, but it's very easy to see um, how, of course, climate change has always happened throughout. Uh, the, the, the beginning of time. Um, the problem is the rate of this climate change now that is occurring. You know, if I were to leave, this is a very big room here. It's a very big room. It's about uh, in, in feet, I would say it's about uh, 10,000 10, square feet, this room. Um, if I were to leave a single heater on in a corner, um, eventually it will have an effect, even if it's one single heater. Um, if I were to turn that heater off, of course, it would have a different effect. And the people say, well, this is just such a big world. How can what we're doing affect it? it? It does. It really does. It is affecting it. It is affecting the world. And uh, we just have to plan differently and better because what we're doing is not. Mm, absolutely. In coming back to your 2021 projects, I saw something on your Instagram page that I actually love the idea because it's in Washington, D.C. It's transcendence. Is this still the dream? Is, is it a project that's going to be happening? All projects were once dreams. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so just that is that close. I'm just excited because of that. Because I'll be running there. <laughs> thank you. Well, I have uh, quite a few dreams uh, that I'm working on towards uh, having them become projects. And that is one of them. And what is transcendence about? Transcendence is about humanity. It's about, uh, 
exactly that, transcending uh, to um, a, a higher a higher place. Um, and basically, it's what I think a lot of people are are trying to say. You know, learn to live responsibly, learn to live um, a, in harmony uh, with nature, uh, to change the ways, to change what we're doing. Uh, different type of economy, economy that will benefit everybody. Um, you know, the world is changing. I think COVID um, has been very, very hard on the world and and it will bring a lot of change. Hopefully, I think it will bring an awakening. Mm -hmm. This is the first time in history, uh, modern day history, where we have all been affected by uh, an event. Because if you think even World War I or World War II, although they were called world wars, uh, essentially they were fought um, in the Northern Hemisphere, essentially. Of course, there was uh, the Pacific War. Um, I was not in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, but you think of Central, uh, South America was not affected uh, and many parts of uh, Central and Africa weren't apart from Northern Africa. Of course, most of Europe was, Russia was, the States was, the US and Canada were not affected. Uh, but now, um, you know, they were affected economically, but there weren't battles fought on every single continent and in every single country. COVID is fought in, in every single country and city on the planet. Um, so this has affected humanity as a whole. It is going to change humanity. Uh, some people will take advantage of this to try to change it in probably a way that we wouldn't want them to. Um, but on the other hand, I think it'll also bring, or could bring, if we act in the right way, it could bring a new renaissance, um, a, new, a new hope, this, this idea that, and this notion that all of us were involved and all of us were affected by it. And it didn't matter whether you were poor or rich, um, it affected you equally. Um, so... Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens, uh, hopefully, when this is over. Um, I tend to look at uh, what happened in the last uh, uh, great outbreak, which was the Spanish flu. And it looks like uh, what's happening today looks very much like the Spanish flu, how it's, it lasted about two years. It came at first, and then it went away in the summer. People relaxed. And it came back with a vengeance uh, the following winter. Um, and it took two years for it to dissipate. Yeah. We'll see. A lot of artists went through a depressive mode this year. So we actually had meetings once a month with a um, uh, counselor because of that, just to, you know, we have conversations with artists. How has this situation affected your work? Has there been any, any effect at all? Uh, I think it has had two effects. Of course, because my artwork is stirred by emotions, for me, it's been a very creative uh, year because also more than ever, or at least in recent times, I've been able to dedicate myself to the work because I'm always traveling. Last year I traveled uh, 250 days, um, meeting clients, uh, uh, going to art shows, uh, and so forth and so on, business trips. Um, so it really only left uh, a little bit over 100 days to the creative side and working here. Uh, although, of course, when I'm traveling, I'm also working because I'm always drawing and then setting things forth. Um, <clears throat> but this year I was able to actually be here. I, I was almost forced to, we were all forced to stay in. 
And I, I found an incredible creative energy. And uh, I created more this year than, than any other year in the past. So I think that um, I was able to channel this, uh, uh, my energy into, uh, in, into creativity um, and not turn it into, of course, uh, I was very anxious and I, and I felt uh, uh, I was very worried for what was happening. Uh, like everybody, you know, I have three children. I have a beautiful wife. Um, I was also, everybody, of course, is worried about their livelihood. Um, also worried about the economy. What is going to happen to the galleries or to the gallery that represents me? The gallery that represents me is Halcyon Gallery and they're in London. And they have been... Uh, of course, very affected by it because uh, like all galleries all over the world because people just simply can't go to the gallery. The gallery is closed. They're, they're closed by law. So uh, they've had to also reinvent themselves um, and work a lot online, create online shows. So the business is changing also. It's going towards the... Uh, online a lot than the, the non uh, physical presence um, which will be interesting to see how technology can help there because I think it's easier to do with two dimensional art it's a little bit harder to do with uh, three dimensional work uh, yeah you can scan a work uh, and uh, in fact we're a lot of my Sculptures, we're now turning them into um, virtual uh, art so that you can, you know, place it on a, uh, on a table or in your room. But it's not the same, you know. Yeah. You, you can't feel it. Uh, and you want to feel it. And so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how the actual affects the market as a whole. Um, Sotheby's and Christie's, uh, overall did less business this year. A lot, you know, they did a lot less business. They did 30% less, which is a lot for these big companies. Uh, but interestingly enough, of the 30% less, 95% uh, of it was online. Wow. Wow. So the year before, online was 15% of their business. This year, online was 95% of their business. There you go. And that's how we're shifting. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. All you got to do is ask Amazon how they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to thank you for your time. But before we go, speaking of creativity, so we also were booming with creativity here and we're launching uh, the new platform that we're going to be sharing this interview also besides the Arthur International TV show is going to be the Winner's Journey podcast, which is my podcast. And I'll be sharing that. And I'm asking one question before we go. Um, the Winner's Journey is about you win, you winning. You winning, but not winning because you were in a competition, but winning because you overcame so many challenges to get to where you are. So can you share with us one challenge that you had to overcome, one interior spiritual challenge that you have to overcome to, to make it happen, to make your dreams come true? Yeah, I think you yourself are your biggest challenge to overcome, always. You can be your worst enemy. So overcoming yourself, that is the biggest challenge. If you believe in yourself, I, I know that so many people have said this, but so many people have said this because it is true throughout the ages, it has proven to be so. If you truly believe in yourself and you follow your dreams, you will be able to achieve, if not all of them, many of them. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Lorenzo, for your time. I'm super honored that we were able to share your studio as well. Thank you. And anybody can visit your studio or I know there's going to be people that probably are nearby after COVID, of course. 
can they visit? Do they set up appointments or just check you out? Yeah, we, we obviously we set up appointments because this is a working studio. I have to work. Um, it's not a, you know, it's not a gallery. It's not a museum. Um, so it, it is open, but by appointment. And I dedicate certain days of the month to do that. Okay, that's good to know. Thanks very much for, for sharing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Ciao. I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.